start with a confession, which is that I kind of like computers better than I like people. <laughs> so when I ask you the question, will computers replace teachers, my bias is to say, dear God, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, I think you, you all have experienced this phenomenon probably on the way here. Uh, when you checked in for your flight, you hopefully, if everything went well, used a kiosk instead of talking to a human at the airport. You needed a little bit of cash, you went to the teller, you went, you went to the ATM instead of talking to a human teller. There are so many places in our society already that have been made so much better by removing humans. So education, as always, unfortunately, is lagging in this respect. And uh, what I'd like to talk to you today is just kind of about how we can solve that problem and the, the people out there who are solving that problem already. I want to kind of look at both ends of the spectrum. So uh, I'll talk kindergarten and then I'll talk college. Uh, I think for some people who aren't familiar with what's going on out there, the idea of online education for kindergartners sounds a little bit absurd. Um, you have this sort of image of people sitting in their parents' basement somewhere with the blue light of the computer in their face, just typing away lonely. Um, but that's actually, uh, I think, increasingly not where online education is going. Um, instead, it's to the, the blended learning model that Jim described uh, a little bit earlier, and I'll get into more of that now. Um, but first, I kind of want to take a poll. Who has young kids or, or grandkids in the, in the room? How many of you have some kind of an Apple product in your lives? How many of you have had to fight one of those young kids or grandkids because they desperately wanted to like smear applesauce on your apple? Right. So I have a two-year-old. She honestly loves my iPhone more than she loves me. And the prospect that we would you know, look forward to her education and send her into a building where there will be you know, maybe one computer in a classroom or where, where they'll be learning how to add or subtract or do their ABCs on a piece of paper with a pencil, when right now at age two, she's begging me for the flashcards app. Please, please. Uh, it just seems very backwards and, and wrong. And I think uh, anyone who is, who is hung out with kids will agree. Um, these awesome online education tools, though, do not do all the things that we want from our education system. Frankly, again, as the mother of a two-year-old, kids are pretty annoying and take up a lot of your time. Uh, which is why we love school. They go away all day long to another place. And you know, uh, warehousing is a dirty word in, in the educational establishment, um, particularly in traditional schools. They don't really like to point to that fact about what they do. But there's nothing wrong with warehousing children. In fact, we should embrace this function, and schools, I hope, in the future will do it on a schedule that looks more like the working schedule of adults in America. The kids could go to a building somewhere nine to five all year round because I don't know about you guys, but I have to go to a building somewhere from nine to five all year round and work. Uh, luckily, it's at Reason, so it's awesome, but uh, you know, this, is, this is something that is a, a real incompatibility in our systems. Uh, but warehousing does not have to mean the sort of dreary, machine-like image of education that we just saw. Um, instead, I'd like to tell you about a couple of sort of huge success stories that are already going on right now. Um, the first is, I think uh, many of you are probably familiar with the KIPP schools, which are um, just a sort of runaway success uh, charter school organization. Um, there are many schools all around the country. They cater mostly to poor and minority kids. So um, these are in urban neighborhoods. They're generally kids that have been left behind by the, the current education system. Um, there's a bunch of these in California, including a, a couple of new ones that opened up in the Los Angeles area uh, a couple years ago. KIPP Empower is one of them. Uh, California, as we have heard uh, extensively and we'll hear more, is in the middle of the nation's most photogenic budget crisis. It's just, you know, California really does it best. Um, so, uh, so of course, one of the things that California is doing is uh, cutting funding to one of the few things that works in their education system. Uh, so a new KIPP school was set to open up. California decided to cut $200,000 from the budget of the school, which is a big deal for, for a school like KIPP. Um, but this was an opportunity. So what they decided to do was uh, try out some of the new online learning tools that were out there. Instead of classrooms of 20 with a teacher and a teacher's assistant, which is you know, the kind of baseline KIPP model, they decided to try out classrooms of 30, same staffing, 
15 computers. So what this means is this is a perfect example of blended learning. The kids go all day, they have a great educational culture, they have a, you know, a, a human who is there, who's a certified teacher, and then a, a teacher's assistant. But at any given time, a bunch of the kids are on the computers, which means you can have reading groups of seven or 10 kids and still have the other 15 kids doing really substantive learning. In fact, and this is where I get to the computers are totally better than people claim, uh, the 15 kids who are on the computers are probably, in many cases, learning more or getting something that they weren't getting uh, in both traditional schools and even maybe at other KIPP schools. Because the computers have all these attributes that humans don't have. They are infinitely patient. And, you know, for anybody who has sung the ABC song 10,000 times in a desperate attempt to teach kids that LMNOP is not one letter, a computer will sing it 10,000 times. A computer will give you a new little clip art illustration for the letter A every time over and over until you get it. Computers also have great memories. So uh, what happens in, with these KIPP programs is that they, um, they record everything that the kids are doing when they're on the computers. And the teachers or the teacher's assistants uh, review the kids' scores at the end of the day. And they see, oh, you know what? Uh, I wouldn't have caught this if everybody was just reciting something out loud in the classroom, but you know, little Logan is having trouble with the difference between C and K. I need to check up on him on that. Or um, you know, uh, little, little Timmy doesn't understand that cows and pigs are different animals. We gotta, we gotta buckle down and really focus on that. Um, there are a bunch of amazing companies that are providing these products. I, would, I, I talked to a bunch of people who have said, you know, either for their own kids or for people that they know, they're really looking for ways to supplement or replace traditional education. Um, education Elements is a for-profit firm that works with KIPP, and it's absolutely worth noting here that a lot of the providers of these online tools are for-profit. They're, they're in it to make money, so they're trying to provide the best, most competitive product out there. And these are schools with limited budgets, so they're trying to get the most bang for their buck. It's like this magic mechanism, it's so cool. Um, so you know you can go into you can go into one of these classrooms, into one of these KIPP classrooms, and see kids uh, doing a reading tutorial on iStation, which is one popular program. Um, there's an estimation game on Compass Learning where kids uh, follow an animated chef who throws cinnamon buns at them. You know, I, I wish I had had teachers who threw cinnamon buns at me, but it never happened. And and these kids are going to have that um, have that opportunity. Uh, you know, the best teachers, the absolute best teachers can know these kinds of things about their kids almost uh, instinctively. You know, I think we've all had really excellent teachers who have this kind of grasp of where everyone is in their classroom all the time and what help that kid needs. Most teachers are not the best teachers. A lot of teachers really, really suck. I mean, a lot. We're asking a lot of teachers. They have to be babysitters, they have to be mentors, they have to be coaches, they have to be subject matter experts. Uh, there's no reason why one person should be performing all of those functions. There's no reason why people at all should be performing some of them. So this is kind of an opportunity to branch out from that. Um, KIPP's results are great uh, across the board, but uh, this particular KIPP school has, has been a huge success right away. Uh, last year, 36% of the kids' incoming kindergartners were reading at uh, grade level. By the end of that year, it was 96%. They just, they do it. They teach kids how to read. Um, Rocket Ship Education is another company, which is, uh, which is pretty great. They've been out there a little longer. They're based in San Jose. They do uh, K through five, and about 25% of what they do is online. 75% is in person. Um, but again, they're doing it not just better, but cheaper. And this is, you know, increasingly relevant, not just in California, but everywhere. Um, <coughs> The youngest kids in Rocket Ship, uh, they, they, they throw up these kind of prefab trailers that are just, they're colorful, they're nice, they're very cheap. Um, they put them up in poor neighborhoods. You know, everyone at, at Rocket Ship has um, reduced price or, or subsidized lunch. Um, the kids take math lessons on the computer. Uh, there's a program called Dreambox, where talking dinosaurs teach them how to add. Uh, a Rocket Ship school is about half a million dollars cheaper than, than its counterpart for a K through five school. Um, what they do with that half a million dollars is pay teachers more. They have fewer teachers who are better paid. This is a vision that a lot of people have tried to implement in public schools, Michelle Rhee in DC. Uh, for those of you who followed that story, uh, you know, 
basically had to buy off every teacher in the city in an attempt to offer a little bit of merit pay to some teachers, who, just the ones who wanted it, and it's all been reversed since she left. Um, so it's very, very hard to, to figure out ways to pay teachers more even when they are good at their jobs, and Rocket Ship has done that. Um, but I want to kind of go even further down the cost scale and just point out that, um, for instance, in Arizona, it costs about $8,000 to educate a traditional public school student. Uh, Carpe Diem, which is an academy there, it was just based in Yuma, uh, they do it for about 1000 bucks a student. Uh, you can go even further down the scale and go uh, to a, a really amazing finding for one, uh, one laptop per child. Uh, last year, I think they publicized this. They, um, they took a, about 1,000 tablets, Motorola tablets, to a village in Ethiopia where there was no literacy. So this is not like an underserved area in the United States. This is a place where there are no words and there's no power and there's nothing with an on or off switch. And they just dropped a thousand laptops, about one for every kid in the village, and they left them. Within a few weeks, the kids were singing ABCs. They'd figured out how to get, the get them out of their boxes, turn them on. Uh, I think kids were using an average of like 40 apps uh, within a couple months. And within five months, uh, some kid had figured out that uh, they had disabled, there was a camera in these tablets. And because of privacy concerns, they had disabled the cameras. Some kid hacked the Android operating system and turned on the camera five months after the first time he saw a printed word or an electronic device of any kind. <laughs> we do not need $10,000 a year worth of public education for kids to do stuff. This is, this is you know, we're, we're doing it wrong if these kids are doing it right. Um, so I guess, you know, what I'd, what I'd just like to kind of highlight there is that kids want these computers so badly. They just want to learn online. The idea that somehow the screen time will harm them or that they won't um, be appropriately socialized, I think, is, is really misguided. What we're hoping to socialize these kids to is, I think, in a lot of cases, white collar jobs, like the kind that most of us are lucky enough to have, to, you know, to put them into schools that are structured around the kind of industrial, you know, factory worker jobs that don't even exist anymore. Uh, certainly doesn't do them a service. Um, so now I'd just like to talk briefly about the flip end of online education, which is at the university level. I suspect many of you already know more about that. It's certainly been in the news a lot, uh, the massively open online courses or the hilarious, hilarious acronym MOOCs are, uh, are pretty big these days. Uh, Coursera and Udacity are two of the biggest names and edX. Um, those are coming out of Stanford and MIT and Harvard. Um, you also probably know Khan Academy, which is aimed mostly at high achieving high school students. It gives them tutorials of just all manner of stuff that they might have trouble picking up in class. Um, there's also little guys who I think are, are showing a lot of promise too, including um, George Mason's uh, Tyler Cowen and Alex Tabarrok uh, launched Marginal Revolution University, which is named after their blog, which some of you may read. Um, and what they do is uh, they just have one course right now. And it's just the two of them teaching this one course, because that's what they're good at, and offering it up. Um, the problem right now with online ed for college is that uh, there's no iTunes of online ed and there's no Yelp of online ed. So it's hard to know what's good, um, and it's hard to know what em for employers to know what's good once people come out of the far end. Um, this is not something that I am the first person to notice. A lot of these people are trying really, really hard to figure out how to solve this problem. and. Uh, just in the past few days, actually, there have been some interesting developments, including uh, San Jose State has started offering some of their remedial courses uh, through Udacity. They're using online courses to teach uh, remedial statistics and some other things. They cost about $150 a pop, which is significantly cheaper than um, the credits that the school is offering uh, in the traditional environment. Uh, needless to say, the professors at San Jose State are not super thrilled about this development. They shouldn't be. They should be nervous. They are about to be replaced. And I think too often in the debate about online education, people are very careful to say, oh, there's always room for teachers. Teachers are, you know, they're apple pie and flags, and we, we just, you know, we have to give them everything they want forever and ever. There will always be room for really good teachers. There will also always be room for good coaches and good mentors and good counselors. But those people are going to, their jobs are going to look very, very different. And uh, you know, I hope that their pay scales will also look very, very different in the, in the near future. 
Um, there's also been uh, another development, which is that the University of Wisconsin has started offering, say they're going to start offering degrees to people who complete their coursework elsewhere. Um, and they'll just have to take proficiency tests. So this is something that, you know, we've gotten pretty far from the idea that you go to college to learn a set of stuff and then employers will know you learn that stuff because you have a degree. Uh, this is a chance to kind of get back to that. Um, it's just one of the functions of college and, and like the very best teachers, I think some of the very top colleges are fine. They can do whatever they want. They can keep doing exactly what they've been doing. You know, there's, there will always be a demand for a Harvard degree, but um, you know, the San Jose states of the world better hustle because <laughs> they are going to get put out of business. Um, just very quickly, I'd like to talk about policy and uh, of course it's for those of you sporting your yellow scarves, it's, it's school choice week. Um, Reason is having uh, a series of events. We had one in DC last week or earlier this week. We've got this event and there's uh, another one in LA coming up which you can ask Amy about. Um, uh, school choice has, the idea of school choice has definitely um, evolved and expanded. It, it no longer just sort of means the original uh, Milton Friedman vision of, of vouchers and charters, but also uh, also now these new online tools. So I'm, I'm very excited to kind of be talking about this in that context today. Um, there are some policy barriers, which you might not be shocked to hear, uh, to, to adopting some of these reforms. Um, one of the biggest is actually one of the most obvious for K through 12, which is seat time requirements. Um, many, many states have requirements that kids have to have their butts in chairs within the view of a teacher for X number of hours every week. Um, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but of course, the reasons for those rules are obvious. This is a, a great job security measure for teachers unions. It's a great way to make sure that um, even when there are other budgetary pressures that teachers' jobs remain protected. Um, there's also the problem of uh, September to June school year. Uh, for anybody who has ever, you know, moved in the middle of the year, you know, this is like a classic child trauma thing that you have to, you know, do third grade over because your new district doesn't recognize the credits from your old district. Um, that's a huge possible benefit of these online courses is that they could be interoperable across many, many different systems. And then, in fact, you could continue your education completely uninterrupted, even if your parents have to move for a job. Uh, there's also the possible benefit of people being able to stay in urban areas. I live in Washington, D.C., and I have a young child. Things don't look that good for school if I want to send her to public school. And this is why people, you know, creative class workers who would prefer to stay in cities wind up having to leave. It's, it's um, you know, it's not good for those cities. It's not good for the workers. It's maybe not even good for the kids who you know, are missing out on, on the kind of benefits of living in urban areas, which um, they're simply not possible because of, because of the quality of public schools in those areas. Um, teacher to student ratios are another problem. Um, they don't make any sense in a world where, um, you know, some of the teaching is done by uh, a physical teacher who has full credentials. Some of the teaching is done by someone who's an assistant. Some of the teaching could be done by somebody in India who's in your headset saying, hey, why don't you try again on that math problem? You know, that's, uh, I know you can do it, right? You can say that from India. It's no problem. Uh, and the person's name will be like, Bob. It'll be great. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's the biggest problem and the biggest barrier here is just the, the huge political risk to people who want to innovate in this area. There are people who are dying to get into online education. In fact, there are people in this room who I've talked to over the last day or so who are dying to get into online education. We've got folks designing financial literacy courses. We've got people who want to help out their, their friends and neighbors who are looking for ways to, to improve their own kids' lot. But as long as you're at the whim of the machine, it's not worth it to invest a ton of money. It's not worth it to invest a ton of time. It's not worth it to stake your professional future on something that could be wiped out by you know, an obscure vote in a state legislature in the middle of the night by 10 guys who were bought off by teachers unions, which is what happens all the time. I mean, I'm not exaggerating when I say that um, you know, uh, charter schools are often an in for online education, uh, but there are many states now where you can't enroll in a charter, even if you have statewide choice, you can't enroll in a charter that's online focused unless you live in the district where the charter is hosted. I don't 
think they're totally clear on how the internet works <laughs> in that case, because the internet goes to all the districts. So, you know, and it's all about money, it's all about funding. Um, so I, I don't want to end on a, on a kind of pessimistic note, so I'm going to end on a quasi-optimistic note, which is that I don't know if we can, you know, ultimately reform institutions so that the kind of blended learning model that I've described comes to public schools, comes to traditional public schools, but I do know that it's a lot easier to opt out for people who have been daunted by the idea of homeschooling, for people who are daunted by the idea of the price of a private school. Um, you know, charters and vouchers have already made this much more of a real possibility for families who would otherwise have just been stuck with, you know, real estate as destiny for their schools. But uh, I think we're just going to see more and more of that. You know, you can, you can envision all kinds of things, including the flipped school day, where uh, kids consume their lectures at night and just hang out with tutors during the day. You can imagine vast warehouses holding kindergartners or 18-year-olds who just want to get out of the house but would rather, you know, take their courses online. Um, you know, for-profit providers will, will step up here if, if the other components are there. So. Um, I don't know if we can fix it yet, although I do think we can fix it eventually, but I do know that there are a lot of ways to choose not to be a part of the dysfunctional school system that we have right now, and, uh, and they're increasingly online.